Hello. My name is Marijk van der Wende and I work at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. And I'm here on this panel with William Kirby from Harvard University, Simon Martinson from University of Oxford and Dominique Sachsenmeier from Göttingen University. Over the last two years, we collaborated in a research project on the implications of the new Silk Road for higher education and research cooperation between China and Europe. Our dissemination conference planned for mid-May had to be postponed because um, of the corona outbreak and it will be held later this year in conjunction with the launch of our book published by Oxford University Press. But as corona makes our findings only more relevant to the global higher education community, we would like to discuss on this in this online panel some of our main findings in the context of this global pandemic. Which trends in academic cooperation with China will be sustained, enhanced, rebalanced, delayed, or even reversed? And what's most at stake with the changing geopolitical order? Collaboration, competition, open science, trust, or globalization as such? Let me start with some comments from a European perspective. Shifting global flows. In our study, we concluded that global flows are shifting eastwards and that China was gaining importance as a scientific global power, especially in the so-called STEM fields. Well, it seems to me that these trends are being enhanced due to the crisis international mobility of Chinese students to Western countries is in decline and the return of Chinese scholars to China is expected to rise further. Recession forecasts indicate that China will suffer less from the consequent recession than the West and may thus be able to further capitalize on these shifting flows and on its continued investment in higher education and research. For Europe, this could have different implications. A loss in institutional income in fee paying students as, such as the UK, but not in countries where higher education is free or publicly financed like in Germany. May imply a loss of young scientific talent and academic human capital, for instance, in the Netherlands, which has a high percentage of international scientific staff. It may challenge Europe's competitive edge over China, an unbalanced relationship. Our study also concluded that despite more than 40 years of collaboration in research and higher education between Europe and China, the relationship was still quite unbalanced in various respects. And that the rising tensions between the US and China urged China uh, the, UE, the EU to come to grips with this relationship. Well, with Corona, the US-China relationship has become even more tense. Meanwhile, China's face mask diplomacy is taking the new Silk Road as a health Silk Road further into Europe. It was Hawaii, so much contested for building 5G networks in Europe, which delivered the first medical face masks to the Netherlands. Manifestations also in and around universities, notably in countries in the South and in Central and Eastern Europe. The 17 plus one with which China signed new Silk Road agreements, notably Hungary, where the CEU was banned by the government, which then invited a Chinese university to establish a branch campus. We also identified a lack of coherent foreign policy as a challenge for the EU to deal with China on top of the internal issues, such as Brexit. Corona, I think, amplifies these internal issues. Member states choose nationalist solutions and closed their borders. Academic mobility and cooperation in Europe are heavily affected. The economic impact of the crisis implies renegotiation of the EU's multi-annual budget for 21 to 27, 
with uncertain results for investments in higher education and research. We even don't know when borders will be reopened. Perhaps this is the moment to rethink mobility. With our steep learning curve in online teaching and learning and Europe's Green Deal in mind, the idea of a green Erasmus may not be bad at all. The question is whether the EU will be able to sustain its internal open structures on which European academic cooperation is based. And what's more, will it be able to rebuild multinational multilateralism globally? Will China be its partner now? The US seems to be leaving that scene. A last point, how open, how open can it be? In our study, we observed the drive towards open science initiated in Europe and according to some recent statements followed best by China, but leaving major questions open about fair, transparent transfer of knowledge and secure exchange of data. The scientific response in search for a corona vaccine at first seemed to introduce an unprecedented effort of global open science but may well become overshadowed by competition, protectionism, and the blame game about the origin of the virus. The question is, will the EU be able to secure the potential COVID vaccine as a global public good? This is the aim of the EU's president recent successful fundraising effort. China was among the parties that joined and donated. But, the EU has been a great promoter of openness, open borders, open public areas for higher education and research, and open science. In research years, European programs such as Horizon 2020 and Erasmus were opened to the world. But can the EU continue this pathway, or will it have to become more realistic or more strategic? Already before Corona, Member states were asking the EU to negotiate a better level playing field for scientific cooperation with China, for fair exchange of knowledge, equal access to and reciprocity in data for IPR, etc. This could be negotiated under trade agreements. Trade is an area in which the EU has strong legal competencies. And this was how the first EU-China cooperation in science and technology was formally established in 1985 as part of an agreement on trade and economic cooperation. Member States are also asking the EU to protect knowledge, data security and research integrity against foreign interference. Here the EU can only provide guidelines. But with, the, with the corona experience in mind, the EU and China will have to continue their conversations also about technology, privacy and human rights. Europe's, Europe has been sacrificing um, freedom and privacy for safety during the pandemic. But it is the question whether this global challenge will bring them closer together or further apart on these discussions around these issues, these key values. Let me stop here and ask Bill to share his views. Thank you very much, Mariah, um, and welcome all. It's uh, been an enormous pleasure uh, to work with Mariah and, and Simon and our entire team, uh, and of course, Dominic, who is with us uh, today on this volume and on, on what would to, was to have been uh, this conference in Herrenhausen in Hannover. Uh, and we hope to get there someday. Um, but let me focus in uh, just a few minutes on why I think this is an important book and an important theme for a general discussion. It really has to do with the current state and the future nature of universities in Europe, in China, uh, and everywhere in the world, and the places in particular uh, in between Europe uh, and China. If you look at matters historically, the modern university is something born in Germany in 1810 in Berlin, uh, but the University of Berlin is the first modern research university. And every one of us 
uh, of our institutions are in some sense children of that uh, institution. Uh, the Americans, uh, you know, the Germans led the way in the 19th century and dominated what it meant to set global standards in the 19th century. The Americans, particularly in the second half of the 20th century and first part of the 21st, uh, can be said to have established among the leading universities uh, in the world. And I would argue that perhaps no country is better positioned to compete for global leadership in higher education than China, uh, a country with more of the best human capital, arguably, than any place in the world with enormous investments in higher education uh, over the last uh, 20 plus years, uh, with a, a, a higher education system that is the fastest growing in the world in quality as well as quantity. And this is why uh, intrepid uni uh, British universities, uh, such as Liverpool and Nottingham, have established campuses uh, in China. Uh, in America, among American universities, NYU uh, has established a campus in Shanghai, Duke University in Kunshan, outside of Shanghai. Uh, uh, even my own uh, Harvard, less adventurous than those, as uh, we have a center in Shanghai, which I have the honor of overseeing. And if you, can, if you look at the trajectory of the development of modern Chinese universities, just think of the story of Tsinghua University, founded in 1911 as a prep school to send Chinese away to the United States for higher education. Today, ranked by the QS rankings, most recently number 16 in the world, ahead of number 17, which is just fittingly, I think, from Harvard's perspective, Yale University uh, in that ranking. Uh, and Tsinghua University has established a new program, this Schwarzman College, uh, uh, funded by an American uh, businessman and many others, uh, joint venture with Tsinghua. And its aspiration, and with apologies in advance to Simon, its aspiration is to replace the Rhodes Scholarship, which has been the premier postgraduate scholarship in the world, uh, in recent decades as uh, a place where the best and the brightest of the world will go. The best and the brightest of the world, Tsinghua believes, will not want to go to a rainy, uh, foggy, self-isolating island off the coast of Europe. They will want to go to Beijing. We shall see. But the aspiration is there. And meanwhile, China is, if not exporting its model uh, of higher education, because its model is essentially an international model, of, uh, with your enormous European uh, and uh, American influence over time, but expanding its cooperative relationships beyond those in Europe and in, in North America, also to those on the so-called Belt and Road uh, between China uh, and Europe, uh, uh, as a kind of a cultural extension of this enormous infrastructure project. And part of what we are looking at in this volume is what difference this will make uh, in the long run uh, for cooperation between China and Europe and for opportunities of mutual cooperation in the spaces in between. And a central question that we try to address uh, is, will the new Silk Road, as it is called sometimes, uh, be more uh, influential actually than the old Silk Road, uh, keeping in mind that the very term Silk Road is a 19th century German invention uh, for patterns of trade uh, and flows of ideas uh, that were highly sporadic in history, uh, but today uh, flowing with much greater frequency and greater power. Uh, we have put together in this group an extraordinary, and in this volume, an extraordinary uh, set of talent uh, from China, from Europe, some interlopers like myself from, the, uh, from uh, North America, uh, but also from places in between, uh, not the least Russia, which is part of this new Silk Road. Uh, when we look to the future of co academic collaboration on and beyond the new Silk Road, we do have the new challenge, which is so obvious in this forum. We are meeting virtually. We are meeting by Zoom. Uh, will this be the future? of our higher education cooperation between China and Europe and China and the rest of the world. 
Uh, I do not know. I do know that I've taught the second half of my semester here at Harvard entirely by Zoom, and I've had students in different time zones ranging from Korea to Hawaii to South America uh, to Northern Europe to Africa and to India uh, as part of this enterprise. Uh, and they, I have never had students, I have to tell you, and maybe it's just the first term, so engaged and so excited about learning in different ways as we have. And just a day or two ago, uh, I was part of a uh, Harvard Student Forum, Harvard China Forum, as we call it, the Hafo Zhongguo Luntan in Chinese, uh, in which we had a panel on U.S.-China relations. We usually have this every year at Harvard, and we get a few thousand people come to it. This time, uh, it was live streamed in China, and we had 1.2 million viewers. Um, um, I have no idea what they think of it, and it, we will decide in time whether it's a good idea uh, or not. But the world is changing, and it, we are all adapting to it. It, it both limits and gives new prospects for the world of cooperation in higher education. So I thank you all for uh, joining us. And uh, shall I turn now to Simon? Is, is that correct? So, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Bill. Uh, and uh, you've, uh, I think, saved me the, the task of, of, uh, of opening up many of the issues that you've talked about, because uh, you gave us a, um, a very fine summary of the situation with Chinese higher education and its achievements to this point. I mean, I think that um, when we look back on the, you know, the last 30, 40 years, say the most important thing that's happened has been the rise of China, even more important perhaps than the collapse of the Soviet empire and the invention of the internet and even more important than the pandemic and the likely severe recession, which is going to follow, uh, the emergence of China as a front rank global actor uh, and its um, insertion into the civilizational conversation um, with ultimately, I think, the same status as Western civilization in um, consideration of who we are and where we're going at global level. Uh, that's been enormously important. And the question that it raises is, you know, how and why? Um, and what does it mean in terms of um, our institutions, our, our political cultures, um, the way in which we organise and conduct our social affairs? Because China is different to the West in lots of ways. Um, here we have a society which has been able to seemingly abolish the effects of the business cycle, or largely so, uh, since the 19, early 1980s. Remarkably so for a, a country which ideologically is a socialist, socialist society and uh, skeptical about capitalism and yet China's found a way to overcome uh, some of the downsides of a capitalist economy. And it's done that because this is a state-centered model and a state-centered model which is fundamentally different to an authoritarian regime in the West. In the sense that politics is primary over the market, prom politics is primary over all other forms of identity, it seems. And this brings with it both this capacity to manage human, human affairs from a central pivot, which I think the, uh, the debate of the 1930s about whether it was possible to centrally plan um, would have said wasn't possible to do. And yet at the same time, um, you have um, the downside, you know, the sense that the state is always there, that it's in every conversation, it's at the back of every social institution, or, and it's in the forefront in many respects of the universities, uh, that it's difficult to uh, imagine a civil society that's as fecund, uh, as creative, as the sort of civil society which evolved particularly in the United States and which has been such a strength of American civilization. So strong state, able to do things that other states have not been able to do or as well, um, 
and at the same time, the problem of, of political and social freedoms that that creates. And this is now part of our conversation irretrievably. The remarkable thing, I think, given the differences between the West and the East in terms of political and social culture, is how successful and how well the universities have learned to cooperate with each other. And here I think we um, can explain this in terms of the nature of the turn to science and technology in the Dong Xiaoping leadership period in China in the 1980s, when Dong Xiaoping said, we need to learn from the West, we need to open up to the West, we need to invite people into China, we need to send our students and our, and our academic experts out of China into the West to learn, uh, and that we need to build our science and technology to the point where it's at least as good as that in the West. Uh, and this was associated with a fundamental turn to science as an important value in um, policy in Chinese universities and in the productive sector. And with that, the belief that um, for science to do the job in China, it had to be autonomous. Scientists had to make decisions about science uh, and that they needed to be able to cooperate freely with their peers in other parts of the world. Uh, and that was the course that was followed. So as a result, we had a science system and to a lesser extent a university system, which in many respects resembles American universities and Western universities. Um, and as part of that process, the, um, our colleagues in China developed an immense facility in European languages, especially English, but not only English. So the, the miracle of internationalization of science in China was, and was partly carried by, um, by this bilingualism or, or multilingualism, uh, and by the determination and the humility of our Chinese colleagues when they said, we need to learn from, from you. Um, so we have a situation where an immense volume of cooperation has developed. For example, if you look at collaborative research papers involving authors from the United States and authors from China, I mean, the number of those co-authored papers published each year has grown from 2,100 in 1996 to at the last count 55,400 in 2018. And that is by far the biggest collaboration um, in the science literature, in the academic literature, between the one between China and the US. Um, and this is sustained by, I think, a great deal of commonality in terms of commitment to academic values, the importance of cooperation in itself, the importance of knowledge in itself, and um, uh, the commitment to, uh, to working together, to learning from each other, for, for going to each other's places, and, and I think in this, although on the Western side, we have not engaged linguistically with China as we should have, there's been a lot of open door and um, American universities in particular have been very active in China and committed to China, uh, perhaps more so than um, my colleagues in the United Kingdom. Uh, and I think it's something we need to learn from America from, in relation to. Um, but now we face, three great challenges. And, and the first one is, of course, this kind of incipient Cold War that's developing between the United States and China. Um, and particularly, it's centering on competition in relation to technology uh, and, and science and research itself. So that we have a situation where previously collaborative researchers um, uh, were, who, were, who were encouraged to do, to work together, are now seen to be security risks. Um, that the traffic of large numbers of, of doctoral students into the United States has a big question mark over it. And there are pressures increasingly within Europe and in UK also to treat um, these academic and research and science links with China with more caution than before. So we don't know, I think, exactly where that's going to take us, but many of us who are committed as a sort of as a, as a core principle of life to collaboration, understanding, working together, common problems, and learning from the, the great resources that our Chinese colleagues can bring to bear on those problems are worried. Um, the second um, element, of course, 
is uh, the pandemic. And um, the pandemic is likely to lead to a, a uh, uneven pattern of recovery with the signs are, I guess, that um, in China, the universities in science and humanities will recover more quickly than they're going to recover in certainly in the United States and the United Kingdom. Um, already my Chinese colleagues are talking about going back. We've had a, a letter yesterday at Oxford from someone from the MOE who wants to do an extended study of, of, um, of management of British universities and to conduct that study between July and, and November this year. And I can't see how we, we, we would be able to facilitate that work. And yet our Chinese colleagues are ready to go in that sort of way. And that's a small symptom of this uneven pattern of recovery. Um, the, the, I think this will uh, slow things down. And in particular, it's likely that um, onshore international education of, with Chinese students coming into um, the English speaking countries in Western Europe will be slow to recover. Um, and Chinese international education will recover faster and will be active, particularly in um, East Asia. The third issue is more particular to China. Um, it's the, and a, and a symptom of this issue is the problem that the humanities and the social sciences have always had in China in establishing the same kind of academic freedoms and free flowing cooperation that science and technology has been able to achieve at a world scale. That's the, uh, the problem that um, uh, in relation to the humanities and social sciences, they run up against the, the political system itself. Um, I, I, I wonder how long China will be able to combine an a creditable openness to the international sphere with a relatively tight level of internal political control in relation to key discipline areas. Uh, it's always been a potential tension. Um, we would all like to see uh, our colleagues in China freer to talk about issues of national values and culture to um, Dem to demonstrate a capacity not only to raise critical policy alternatives, but also to explore diverse methodologies and diverse theoretical currents um, in areas where the party state may feel it has a monopoly. Um, at the moment, things seem to be moving in the other direction. I think if China can establish the kind of robust um, relationship between the humanities and the social sciences inside the universities and the civil conversation outside the universities and into the media and the public space, then ultimately it'll be greatly to the benefit, not only of China itself, but also to the rest of us, because we will have the opportunity to learn from a Chinese perspective or, or multiple Chinese perspectives on many of the great challenges that confront us. Thanks. Well, thanks a lot and hello everybody. And uh, likewise, it's been a great pleasure to work with Marike, uh, Simon, Bill and all the others on this uh, wonderful and intellectually enriching project with uh, the meetings that we've had at Utrecht, Oxford, at uh, Tsinghua University and in so many other places. And it's indeed a pity that uh, we are not uh, meeting in person right now in Herrenhausen but uh, at least that uh, we have like this exchange, uh, this online exchange, and uh, let's hope that we'll be able to meet uh, in December and follow up with a genuine conference or with some, some online components, obviously. So yeah, um, I think, I mean, this Corona crisis has not only, of course, uh, disrupted our conference uh, schedule, but it also, well, poses a major intellectual challenge uh, when we also, also when we think about the future of uh, Chinese, European, or Sino-Western academic relations, and I think I mean one is uh, one aspect is the uh, well at the highest political level the rising tensions, the mounting tensions that we see at the moment. The other one is, and if we look back at the first half of the 20th century, there's something important to consider. I mean, this uh, epidemic is likely to trigger a series of economic fiscal, and then by implication, even social and political crisis. 
And the question of how these play out globally and locally will likely have a very big impact on patterns of academic migration and also what uh, countries will be seen as like an attractive destiny for students and scholars to go into. I mean, there have been, uh, there has been in a number of countries a rising incidence of, uh, well, uh, racist or anti-foreign uh, incidents and, and, and uh, cl uh, opinion climate swings. And of course, if that would uh, happen or occur at a greater level in certain societies, this will likely have a very big impact on uh, academic migration. And the same is true also for, well, uh, academic policies or national policies on, uh, that might limit the number and the possibilities of going as a student somewhere else, let alone, of course, also the financial impact of, uh, that, uh, on, on families that, of course, after all, have to finance the student movements and on governments that have to finance academic collaboration. Well, I think we can all be very uncertain on how this crisis will play out uh, locally and globally, but uh, there are some things that we are, according to my opinion, can be pretty sure about what will be, that will be framing the interactions between Chinese and European slash Western academia in the future. The first one, and I think uh, uh, the three previous speakers have already mentioned that, I think the future of these relations will be unusually political or politicized. On the one hand, uh, on, uh, because um, um, there's like a tightening governmental control on Chinese, on Chinese university campuses on the side of the, uh, in, in China. But also on the other hand, because uh, uh, academic collaboration with, um, in, with European countries or uh, with the United States, has become also a very politicized issue on campuses. I mean, it's in the subject of university politics, right? So it is no longer, we, I think we are past an age in where um, opening up to China was seen by many like academic decision makers, but also a large number of the faculty was seen as a major opportunity as in value in and of itself. There's a rising climate of distrust, of anxiety, of losing, on, of being on the losing end on, uh, of uh, the, the idea that intensifying the academic relations with China uh, will uh, be ultimately highly disadvantageous for one's own university and one's own country. Um, and I think people like myself who are in, based in an Asian, East Asian studies department have to, well, we experience it like I, I, from, from various, well, uh, academic representatives, like colleagues, but also from foundations and so forth, like a certain, I mean, we experience this on on uh, a daily, if not uh, or a weekly, monthly basis, these kinds of uh, problems. And I think this is something that will continue to frame the relationships in the future. I mean, this, uh, I think, if establishing, intensifying collaboration with Chinese universities will have to actively work against this climate, as I just, just described it. That's one thing. The second is, and I think Marek, uh, already uh, also alluded to that uh, or mentioned uh, certain points uh, related to that is that uh, I think we are past the age of globalization as we have known it since the 1980s. I think uh, the term deglobalization carries, of course, it has a lot of problems, but I think in some ways we are in an age of deglobalization where uh, this free floating interaction, the idea that the world is becoming an interconnected space by driven by the networking of economic agents and maybe also civil society and academic agents. That's in some ways like a think of the past. And uh, again, to the, coming back to the earlier point, political intervention is much more important and uh, as an important factor. Um, I think this, is, uh, this will certainly also, this kind of deglobalization will affect uh, the uh, university sector. And I think it will particularly affect, like deglobalization at large in the economic sector, this will not mean that all there will be a rollback, that uh, all of the globalization of the last 30 years will be undone. Some sectors will be more affected than others in the deglobalization, the uncoupling of uh, uh, transnational academic networks. And I would think that uh, especially the humanities and the social sciences might be, if we don't pay, uh, if we are not careful, might be really severely affected by uh, the spirit of deglobalization for different reasons. Firstly, 
they don't, um, they are, uh, in some ways, uh, they are, uh, well, they raise questions that we can be seen as, of course, highly politically problematic in, in, in different countries. That's uh, on the one side. On the other side, I mean, the, uh, the availability of private funds, like in fields like finance or like the mint fields, uh, will not, uh, is of course not given for the humanities and the social sciences. They rely on public funding. They rely on universities and foundations funding uh, transnational collaboration more so than, than many other fields. And I think that's why uh, the humanities, as I say, and the social sciences will have to take uh, uh, be particularly sensitive and have to really ask themselves some tough questions about the f future uh, 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 to come. Um, and then what would be like uh, some of the, the questions that we would have to ask? I think particularly the question of, well, um, academic collaboration working in favor of China. I think in that case, in the case of the humanities and social sciences, I don't, of course, there's not much, as much a danger of, well, giving away uh, know-how and technological knowledge, or maybe even patents, whatever, economically relevant knowledge to Chinese uh, uh, universities. That's uh, one thing we should uh, uh, have in mind. The second thing is that uh, the humanities uh, should not be, um, we should not re reduce the idea, as it is often done, of the Chinese humanities to the political control that is happening on Chinese university campuses. The Chinese humanities are a very pluralistic landscape. And uh, just as Bill uh, and, and, and Simon just uh, mentioned their contribution with an eye on the Chinese humanities, the Western academia can benefit a lot from that. And I think, I mean, the growing significance of China as an academic partner, but also as an object of thought when we're thinking through globalization and maybe the role of Europe in, uh, in globalization is something that uh, would be highly problematic to be undone. If we have a relocalization of the, of the humanities and the social sciences, we could quickly, very quickly come back and arrive back at a, at a very Eurocentric outlook of the European humanities and social sciences. And mind you, I think uh, in, in many countries, on many university campuses, the age of Eurocentrism in large parts of the humanities and social sciences has never ended. So it would be almost tragic if we would, uh, if this would be terminated and this would severely limit, I mean, of course, the intellectual possibilities, the excitement of a field, but also, I mean, the ultimately the political relevance of what humanity, what the humanities and social sciences can bring uh, to the table. Because, and I think that we are definitely looking at an age where uh, that is, where the idea, the, the possibilities of great conflicts, of polarization is a realistic scenario. And I think that uh, some fields that are trying to critically reflect on, uh, on the, the, some of the issues and some of the discourses that could feed into and funnel further, further funnel these conflicts will be of absolute importance. And for that, of course, the um, collaboration, not only between European universities and Chinese universities, but some wider patterns, global patterns of interactions that they feel in these fields will be of crucial importance. Thank you. I'll turn it, uh, return it back to Marit. Thank you all for your contributions. Um, that's a wonderful um, range of, of different perspectives. Let me start with with a first question and please follow up with your own um simon said um china has been very open to learn especially um when it started its um opening to the west policies some decades ago um and was willing to to learn um dominique said we we can learn a lot from china but how open are we to learn from China and how open is China at this point to, to share some of the essential uh, knowledge that we that we all um, are looking for at this um, at this point in history. Bill, can I go back to you? Well, you know, you can look at it in several dimensions. Um, one of the things uh, I finished a uh, business school, Harvard Business School case study uh, uh, in March on Huawei which I gave its inaugural teaching in my last 
in-class teaching uh, that I did. And it's a, it's a fascinating story the more one gets into the history of this company. Um, it's a company that really began uh, really as a startup. There's no question about that uh, with just a few hundred, a few thousand dollars put together by the founder and partners. And it made its rep, it was initially very unsuccessful in China. Uh, was not able to get into the 3G networks in China. And it was only by going abroad, uh, by winning contracts in Africa, in Latin America, in Russia, then in Germany, and then in, in Britain, uh, that it gained a reputation for quality in China. And one of the interesting things is that you know, Chinese companies, just like Chinese universities, measure themselves in quality against the rest of the world. And it was then successful in China because it had legitimized itself and made its success internationally. Now, somehow or other, it is seen simply as a Chinese company and as a state-led enterprise, uh, which it is not, although it is disingenuous to say that it has no ties uh, with the Chinese government. And it shows both the strengths and the limits of internationalization. Uh, this is a company that is now extraordinarily successful in China. And I have to say, stunningly unsuccessful in political and public relations uh, around the world, but in particular in the United States. Uh, this is a case study of, I might have given it the subtitle of how not to succeed in Washington, uh, because virtually every mistake that could be made uh, will have been made uh, by this company. And yet it is part of a global web uh, so closely tied to European telecom, uh, to American chip manufacturers, uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, vendors to Huawei is the leading semiconductor company in the world, uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Country. And you see this whole realm of both the uh, intellectual web of learning one from another, uh, sometimes without proper IP protection, but they're learning one from another, and American efforts to hammer this simply as a Chinese company, which of course it is, uh, has the prospect of damaging allies in Europe and not the least allies in Taiwan. Uh, and it is the lack of comprehension of the, of the difficulty of disentangling this interconnected world. Here, just one example of technology uh, that um, uh, is seemingly beyond the ken of American policymakers uh, today. To flip to another side, however, and I think Simon uh, uh, and Dominic brought this out uh, with, with great force. Uh, China is in the forefront in so many areas, in education, uh, in the sciences, particularly in engineering and applied sciences. Tsinghua is sometimes ranked as the number one engineering school uh, in the world. Um, and that, is, that goes seemingly without, without, without saying these days. And it's a remarkable achievement, an achievement that really goes back over a hundred years of uh, scientific and technological development in China. But at every major Chinese university today, as Simon uh, brought out, you know, there is an increasing crackdown on, the level, on academic discourse uh, which, whenever it can veer even remotely into the realm of politics. You know, Tsinghua University is a great scientific and economic uh, power, but in the 1920s and the 1930s, it was the leading comprehensive university rooted in the arts and sciences, in the liberal arts and sciences uh, in China. And the epitaph of one of its great scholars of that day, a guy named Wang Guowei, who committed suicide in 1927 in political prote protest, uh, his Memorial, the stone there created by one of his uh, German educated uh, followers, Chen Ingke, uh, said his was a spirit unfettered and a mind independent. And this, these, the eight characters uh, that are on that stone are known by everybody at Tsinghua University today and known not the least uh, by leading uh, critics of the Chinese government who are on the Tsinghua faculty today. Uh, 
Uh, they have paid ritual visits to that stone in recent years. And last year at the anniversary of Tsinghua's uh, at its annual celebration of its founding, uh, one professor, uh, Professor Xu Zhangrun, went there and discovered that the memorial stone was surrounded by a construction fence because it was under repair. It was inconvenient to honor this spirit of Tsinghua. But that is as much a central part of the history of this university and indeed the internal spirit of the university than as is its excellence in science and technology. And this is a battle going on within the walls of this and every other Chinese university today that we need to follow very carefully. Yes, I agree with what Bill said, and I'm conscious of the same memorial in Tsinghua, which was shown to me when I was there for a couple of weeks last year. Um, first question was uh, about China, and the other question is about the West, I think. Um, can, will China, uh, remain open to share. Um, I think it's a case of watch this space. Um, China's task now, I think, is, to, and we perhaps should distinguish between China's universities and China as a government or as a political system, but this applies to both. Um, the task is to combine that continuing openness and humility towards uh, the achievements of others, which has served China so well in the last 40 years with agency, you know, that China going out, as it translates in English, the idea that China's contribution to the world is also valid and important, primary in many respects and needs to be brought forward. So getting that combination of, of humility and openness and advocacy and, and engagement and openness right is quite tricky, I think, and a little bit different to the, the Dong Xiaoping era. Um, I'm not sure whether, the, the, uh, whether that strategy's been got right at the political level, but I think in the universities, it's in many respects, is well handled. And I'd, if it was just the universities managing China's relationship with the world, I'd feel much more optimistic about the world. The, the other side, of course, as you said, was are we open to China? And I think here, we've all pointed to problems and Dominic particularly, I think articulated those really well, you know, the sensitivities that now exist around relations with China, the idea that China and building relationships with China might look like a negative rather than a positive. What a change that is. And that's a worrying one. I mean, I think the unfortunate fact is that globalization, which was doing a lot of good in, in driving a more integrated and convergent world up to about 2010, didn't proceed to the point where the old English language domination of world culture began to pluralize a bit further and um, Chinese language and Chinese culture became central rather than marginal to the global conversation. We didn't reach that point um, where uh, what you might call a peaceful, um, peaceful involvement of a, and peaceful creation of a multilingual culture. Uh, and that looks a lot less likely now. I'm quite sure that it's what we need to do at a world level. Again, the universities are more advanced on this than the societies are uh, and the political systems. But at the moment, the Western universities are not sufficiently China deep, not enough language capacity, not enough real curiosity about China's remarkable history and tradition, which is as deep and as complicated and as worthy of respect as Western civilization is. So a long way to go, I think, in recovering that momentum. Um, and we seem to be moving backwards. But the hope, I think, is science. Science has established an enormous level of collaboration at a world level. Um, and a, a lot of people who look at science and trends in science argue that that's driven by bottom-up cooperation primarily, not primarily by policies or resources, but by the willingness of people to work together to create new knowledge and the excitement that that mission brings to them. And we've yet to see, I think, because it, it hasn't been fully tested, whether that spirit of bottom-up cooperation across borders can survive in this present period where the national identity and national tensions are being asserted more directly. I think if scientists can keep working together and can overcome the barriers that now seem to be rising, in, um, then again, the outcome will be a lot better. Thank you, Bill. And Simon, 
and Dominique. And let me now continue this conversation with another set of colleagues who contributed to our research project. And they are Nan Chaiyu from Shanghai Jiao Tong University, Jerry Postelliona from Hong Kong University, and Anthony Welsh um, at the University of Sydney. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Mark, for the introduction of the research project and the, the uh, conclusions of the research. Actually, a special thanks for Mark for the for initiating the project, uh, leading the project, of course, for the last uh, two years. Uh, it's been a great pleasure for me uh, to be involved in the project for the last two years. Uh, I just uh, add a few remarks uh, from my uh, side. Uh, first of all, uh, now is a very difficult time for internationalization, globalization in general for the last few years, actually, uh, because of the US uh, American first policy and many other things, of course. And uh, this uh, difficulty is uh, complicated recently by the corona uh, uh, crisis. But personally, I think uh, the impact of the uh, corona uh, pandemic uh, will be temporary. After a couple of years or whatever, uh, it will become a normal. Uh, I mean, without the corona uh, uh, virus. Uh, at this, uh, as the book, uh, the introduction of the book has sa said, uh, at this kind of difficult time for internationalization and globalization, we need to stand up, we need to speak out uh, for, uh, to support and to promote uh, internationalization and globalization. And this uh, project and the book, uh, uh, provides uh, timely analysis and insight for uh, internationalization, international collaboration between China, Europe, and actually other parts of the world along the Silk Road. Uh, so th this is my uh, uh, first uh, point. I'm very positive about the uh, collaboration, uh, international collaboration. Uh, my second point is uh, about the differences between uh, Chinese and European universities, higher education systems, or research uh, in general. Of course, there are many differences. Nevertheless, I, I, actually, I have been asked about these kind of questions all the time in the last few years or last 10 years. Uh, uh, Yes, there are differences between these different systems uh, of higher education or research. Uh, nevertheless, universities in Europe, particularly uh, research universities in Europe and in China, have a lot of more in common than the differences, which is also reflected in the book, uh, part of the uh, conclusion. Um, I discussed this uh, in one of the project seminars uh, with colleagues that the large majority of the functions and activities uh, of uh, research university, both in Europe and China, they are very similar and they are converging. Uh, somebody even uh, was seeing maybe at least 80% of these kind of functions and activities are similar and converging. Uh, the difference uh, are really ab uh, about the part of uh, rule of governments and uh, uh, some ideological uh, education uh, issues in these the different parts of the world. <coughs> Uh, of course, each uh, system has its, uh, or each university actually even, has its own uh, characteristics. This kind of, uh, particularly there's always 
seeing about uh, Chinese characteristics. Uh, I personally think, of course, the Chinese characteristics, whatever that means, different people talk about the characteristics uh, with different uh, understanding. Uh, whatever that means, uh, the Chinese characteristics are the best choice for China. I, I would assume the uh, characteristic, characteristics of European universities or higher education systems are the best uh, for, 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 for European countries. So these uh, uh, characteristics, characteristics have not prevented the uh, more than 40 years of collaboration uh, between China and Europe, uh, the universities, uh, both higher education and the research, of course. And they are, I think, they will not prevent the next 40 years of collaboration between China and Europe. Uh, uh, to some extent, uh, these characteristics, both, I mean, Chinese and the European, or some of the European countries, are positive. Uh, to international collaboration are positive, it may, can make positive contributions to the uh, in, to international collaborations between China and Europe. Uh, this is my second point. Uh, my third point uh, would be about uh, the challenges ahead. Of course, as America just mentioned, there's a lot of challenges. Uh, I agree with all those challenges. Uh, but the lessons of history show us that the best response to these kind of challenges are uh, international collaboration. We should, uh, you know, uh, resolve these kind of challenges, uh, pro global uh, problems by international collaboration. Uh, so, uh, and also uh, it's of great great value to have a, a, a various kinds of structured dialogue, structured coordination, uh, platforms or tools, instruments, whatever you call. Uh, the Belt Root Initiative, which is the theme of the book, of the project, provides an excellent platform to further collaborations between China and Europe in higher education research. And uh, actually also, not only uh, it's uh, the Belt Road Initiative is a uh, platform, but it's also, uh, it also provides opportunities and uh, uh, financial and other support tools for such collaboration. Uh, since the Chinese government, uh, uh, governments at different levels, are investing more and more in higher education research in the past uh, 10 or 20 years. And uh, so this kind of uh, collaboration uh, should be uh, enhanced by uh, uh, the Belt Root Initiative. Anyway, uh, I, I personally, again, I think uh, we should work together to support and promote international collaboration and uh, contribute to, uh, in the Chinese see quite uh, often now, the shared future of higher education research for both Europe and China. Thank you very much. This is Jerry Post de Leon and I'm speaking to you from my office at the University of Hong Kong and I want to thank you, Professor Van der Vende, for organizing this splendid event. And I also want to take an opportunity to congratulate you and Professor uh, William Kirby on the successful editing of the volume. And, um, and it's a pleasure to be here today with my colleagues, Professor Leo Mantai in Shanghai, and also uh, Professor Anthony Welsh, my colleague in uh, Sydney. Uh, I'll take uh, a few minutes uh, just to uh, cover the points that the theme of this 
uh, online webinar it has as its focus. Uh, I'll take uh, no longer than five minutes, and I have basically three points. The way I'd like to look at this is what is happening now and uh, uh, in terms of EU and China and, and the world. Uh, again, you, you, you can't take it out of context. What will happen? And of course, uh, we can look in the crystal ball and look at some of the possible scenarios. And then how will all of this affect the uh, cooperation between uh, China and the European Union in higher education? Uh, so first off, what is happening now? Uh, and I think most people would agree that this, we are, we're currently in probably the most unstable geopolitical uh, period since uh, the 1950s or late 1940s. And that is a, a cause of, of concern uh, throughout for, for economy, for politics, for trade, and also for universities. Secondly, uh, the U.S.-China relationship or the China-U.S. relationship, I'm speaking from Hong Kong, so I should say China-U.S. relationship, is at a critical point. It probably has never been so, uh, uh, so troubled uh, since uh, Jimmy Carter and Deng Xiaoping uh, uh, normalized relations and, uh, in, in, in around 1979, 79, I believe. So uh, this is uh, a major problem. Now, is a decoupling possible? There's a debate about this. The two largest economies in the world, can they, can they actually decouple? That, that's a question for another time. And thirdly, this pandemic has obviously intensified the, ten, the tension between the US and China. And uh, so that is where we are. And I think that has strong implications for the relationships with China and the rest of the world. Secondly, what will happen? What can we look forward to? Well, uh, there are three, I see three possibilities. One, and this is the one that I would prefer, that this would be a time for a reconsideration of the fate of humanity, having experienced for the first time, probably uh, in a globalized world, a pandemic, which raises the, the question of, What's the next global crisis? And it, it very possibly will be climate change. And this is an opportunity to reassess values, to, to form alliances, to bring scientists together and, 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 and those in humanities and history and so on. So that's one possibility. However, I must agree, I think, with Professor Leo, and, and this is, of course, not uh, this is also a, a positive scenario in the sense that uh, we will continue with economic globalization, uh, we will get past the pandemic, and we will move forward. Now the question is, will this be slow or fast? I have a feeling it's going to be very rapid. If it happens, if globalization re-anchors re itself with all the pent-up energies and, and, and unemployment, I think it will move very fast. Uh, Number three, of course, is, uh, is, is uh, also pretty negative, and this is the, the, the scenario of the Cold War. And uh, recently, the professor of international relations at People's University, at Redmond University in Beijing, a very distinguished professor, uh, uh, Shuri Hong, said that there is, in fact, a, a Cold War going on between the US and, and China. And that means a lot for the relations with Europe, as well as with other parts of Asia. So how will all of this affect US, uh, U, EU, excuse me, EU, China cooperation in higher education? On the one hand, I think the competition will intensify. You know, we've been, we're, we're, we've been universities probably never before in history have they been uh, uh, in such a competitive international situation. And, and academics, of course, feel this in terms of publications and, and, and uh, impact factors and so on. So I think that will continue. That's not necessarily bad. In fact, if academics, if the academy is in charge of the universities, I think science wins. I think politics will, be, will not affect the work of, of scientists. So, I mean, the weight, a lot of the weight is on the shoulders of academics. We are, we are, we are different. 
we're not politicians and we're not in business. We're in that environment. But academic, I, I think this is a pivotal time for universities. And I think in terms of global security, the universities have a role to play in terms of global peace. Now, maybe I'm, you, might, you might think I'm too naive, but I believe that's true. And, and uh, so in the, the, because the situation with the US and China right now in higher education, this sort of bifurcated economy, uh, bifurcated academy, and the, the slowing of the exchanges, and the, particularly the lack of trust uh, on atmosphere within universities, the profiling of Chinese and Chinese American academics in the US is, is a very serious issue right now. And, and uh, this is, it should be a major concern, I think, for academics. So uh, we, need to, we need to look to the, to the fact that the US higher education system, 39% of its Nobel Prize laureates, 39%, almost 40%, almost two out of five of its Nobel laureates are foreign born. And where do they come from? They come from Europe and they come from Asia. So this may, they, we may see a, a a leveling out or rebalancing globally of the academy. And I think that's where I'd like to stop and, uh, and thank you again for this opportunity to, to discuss some of these key ideas in, in a historical moment, I think, which uh, I have, and I've, I've been around a while, I have never experienced this. So uh, I think the, the academy has a major role to play and this, this particular online conversation is part of that, so thank you. So firstly, I think the um, inspiration for our joint contribution was in keeping with the tenor of the book, the importance of the Silk Road for higher education and the need for scholarship to really look at the implications. Um, arguably, since we all started on this project, it has become even more important given events of recent months um, when the kinds of international collaboration that underpin the rationale of the book have become increasingly challenged um, both on the obvious health front which has um, cataclysmically foreclosed on a lot of international travel and collaboration, um, but also more generally with the rise of nationalism in many parts of the world, including parts of Europe and including elements in China. So what we seem to be uh, heading towards is to some extent great power rivalry between China and the US, which leaves Europe as in some sense um, the hope of much of the rest of the world in uh, working to preserve important aspects of intellectual and cultural collaboration. Um, the other point I think that's important to make, and one that I think inspired uh, the, con the joint contribution of Jerry and myself, is in a sense geographical. This book is about China-EU collaboration, intellectual collaboration. Um, but as we know, the Silk Road embraces Central Asia, um, Europe, but also, as the title to our chapter indicates, it goes south. And that was something that we felt might make a distinctive contribution to the volume, simply by pointing out how important the Silk Road is and how important China is to Southeast Asia, who, of course, are also facing that um, difficult dilemma of trying to steer between China and the United States. So in some ways, China um, 
Southeast Asia collaboration will be arguably even more important in the future, including intellectually. So perhaps I'll stop there, Marike. Thank you, Tony. Thank you so much. Um, Gary um, referred to a um, rebalancing the need, but also the opportunity to rebalance um, the academic uh, global scene. Um, who could take who could take the lead in that? Um, Jerry, first, perhaps. Excellent question, because um, I I have to pick up on Professor Welsh's point, Tony's point, but when he when he seemed to hint that uh, Europe had a special role because of the origin of the contemporary university, we know that China, of course, has the its own academies from the Tang and Song dynasties right through through the Qing and so on. But the kind of university system that uh, all countries pretty much uh, function in is that system which had its origins in either Bologna, in Paris, Oxford, Cambridge. And so Europe has, I think, a special role. It's obvious it's obvious that the U.S. has withdrawn itself, uh, has, has not been able to project the kind of leadership that has been expected of it since the 1950s. In higher education, of course, the universities stand out, okay? So uh, will the, will, can you separate the universities from the context in which they're, which they're in? So I, I t in terms of leadership, uh, as you know, academics are very democratic. So I don't think they would want to, uh, the academy want, would want to say one sector of the academy is going to take a lead. But I think the academy would look to European roots and say there's an important role there to, to, to kind of reconsider the values of the university. You know, they, we've become a multi, you know, you know the multiversity, the university has taken on so many functions and, and some of the core, the core functions sometimes get, get lost in that. Thanks. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I agree with uh, Jerry that uh, there uh, will be uh, some kind of rebalancing of academics. Uh, this kind of rebalancing happened happened in the history, particularly after the Second World War, it's quite uh, huge rebalancing. Now, uh, I think there's already, this is already happening in the last uh, couple of years uh, without this corona uh, crisis because of the US policy. So that there should be. Uh, and uh, I think it's, uh, it should be a good thing uh, the rebalancing it should be a good thing for the world. Thank you. I have one question, uh, which I think maybe we we haven't considered, but I think the test of a rebalancing after the pandemic will be how the universities and the academy can address what is probably the and will become a more intense issue a problem and that's the return and expansion of poverty around the world as a function of the pandemic and of course at the same time the growing inequality which is happening in europe in the united states in china globally because we now live in a capitalist world whether it's neoliberal capitalism or political capitalism that the the intensity of the inequalities and uh, and now poverty so this would be a test i think of universities and as you know top tier universities are increasingly taking in those students who in later on can contribute in terms of endowments or donations and 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 so on and universities have to struggle with these issues of finance so i'm i'm concerned about this issue and, and whether or not a rebalancing will also address this global issue of poverty and inequality. I, like, thank you. Uh, I have a, uh, just 
another comment uh, which I have been thinking for the uh, past a couple of months uh, due to the corona uh, pandemic uh, about the rule of world-class universities uh, after this pandemic uh, of course it's in the general trend of uh, globalization so for those universities, uh, those already world-class universities, if they are uh, de defending uh, strongly the values, ideas of universities, they will continue uh, to be uh, world-class universities. And uh, for those are not or not already world-class, but uh, if they are working hard and defending the values, ideas of uh, universities, make contribution contributions to this globalization, they will become uh, world class universities. But for those who uh, which are not doing anything, just following the government orders, you know, to do all those negative things, I think they are not deserved. Uh, they will not become or sustain to be to be a world-class university anymore. It's just my thoughts in the past couple of months. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, and and uh, because Professor is really, he he's, has a lot of experience in looking at the, tre the trends globally in terms of universities that are able to, to hit a world-class world standard, let's say, okay? Uh, you know, a, a high international standard. So I think he, he has uh, the, right, the right point there. Um, at, at the same time, what occurred to me as I'm talking to him, I know he's in Shanghai and, and we've, we've talked about this. Of course, when I, I, I brought up the question of global poverty, but I, I, it just occurred to me, of course, China has brought 800 million people out of poverty over the last uh, 30, 40 years. So China may have a special role in this so-called rebalancing in terms of higher education. Uh, a, a couple of points. On the, on the one hand, China, I think, is also dealing with this, this question of the top tier universities moving more toward giving access to urban students. Uh, of course, they go to better secondary schools and they score better on the exams and so on. So that's happening. But at the same time, if you look at the tuition fees, uh, which were instituted in around 1994, 95, uh, 6,000 Chinese renminbi per year in the public universities, that, that hasn't changed. It's amazing that that hasn't changed in so many years. So on the one hand, that's something that I think other university systems can learn something from. Uh, I don't know if Professor Leo would agree on that. You were talking about, you were talking about what, what governments do well with universities and what they don't do very well with. But I think uh, affordability and access uh, are big responsibilities for for universities, whether world class universities or or you know getting toward world class, and uh, we often forget about that. You know, we talk about knowledge creation and 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 uh, and and what you know we have to address global health, for example. <clears throat> but it's hard to separate that from poverty. Uh, um, to get back to the point about rebalancing, I think there are two points to be made here. Um, one is the last thing we need as um, intellectuals and researchers is for the world to become divided into two camps, the kind of pattern that persisted for much of the uh, immediate post-war period and in a sense only ended with the reunification of Germany and the reordering of Europe. The last thing we need is to be again to be divided into two camps so that um, countries have to join one or the other and are limited by that. The second point I think to make is that for every country, the effects of this pandemic will be to make economic conditions much tougher. And that includes money for research and for universities. So that makes, again, it underlines the point about the importance of international collaboration because increasingly individual universities will not be able to sustain major research projects. Um, so we will need more collaboration, not less. 
Well, thank you all for your contributions. And in rounding up this panel, uh, let me make two points. First of all, uh, the need for collaboration. As just formulated by Anthony and brought up by all of the panelists, I agree. And as Nian said, we need to stand for that now more than ever. Um, from our study, we already concluded that Chinese universities become more interested in, in European partnerships now as the US-China relations are worsening. And we also noted that many European leaders defend the continuing scientific cooperation with China, underlying the importance of science diplomacy, especially in times of political tensions. Yet, as stated by, by Dominique, um, Corona implies a new challenge to China-European relation. The framing of EU-China collaboration in higher education is being politicized. Conditions for collaboration are changing. Trust may be at stake when these relations look um, as a negative rather than a positive. And we will have to work against, as he said, a climate of tightening political control and, and mistrust. Still, also since the virus outbreak, we see that universities continue their collaboration. Um, the University of Amsterdam, for instance, it has a joint research center for logic with Tsinghua University, and it does continue to teach online, and including now also students from a wider range of Chinese universities. But as Tony said, we will face tougher economic conditions in the post-pandemic period. Hence, also, the need for continued collaboration. Um, we discussed that there may be uneven patterns of recovery between China and the West and between academic fields, uh, notably between STEM and the social science humanities. The latter may run the risk of relocalization or renationalization, as Dominique indicated. STEM may recover sooner in China, as Simon suggested, but also in the STEM fields, there is a risk of fragmentation because of national limitations for reasons of property or security. Yet I think we all agree that the global pandemic amplifies the need for collaboration, for joint efforts in order to find solutions for this and other global challenges. Jerry mentioned poverty, climate change and health. And apart from how political or ideological winds blow, we can build on decades of successful academic cooperation between universities in China and the West. And we have more in common than we often realize. We share the same academic values, although we may not always enjoy the same amount of academic freedom in all areas of academic work. We observe strong convergence in the global science system, but there is no global governance, not in the world and not in higher education. And as Simon stressed, cooperation built on the reopening of China to the West and benefited enormously from China's willingness to learn. Maintaining mutual openness and willingness to learn is, is key for continued cooperation. But how open is Europe to learn from, from China and how open is China to share its knowledge? Mutual understanding as a basis to build trust has been at the heart of intra-European collaboration for, 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 for 75 years now. And there is a continued need for Europe for the academic European academic community to learn about ourselves, to learn more about China and about our historical and future relationships. So this brings me to the second and last point on rebalancing the global academic landscape and the question about leadership. Bill Kirby said that there is perhaps no country better positioned to compete for global leadership than China with its vast and excellent human resources and enormous higher education and research infrastructure. Yet he and other panel members referred to the European origins of the modern research university. And some, Jerry and Anthony, stated the need to reconsider these European roots and key values 
as a basis for global rebalancing. Sure, I agree. But we should realize that in Europe, not only the dependence on financial resources, but also these values are under pressure in some parts of Europe as well. That we have to call on the EU now to protect and defend the values that underpin universities role in society. Institutional autonomy and academic freedom as these are stated in the European Treaty and the European Charter on Human Rights, but not always respected by national governments in all member states. So about Europe's leadership, let's not forget. The EU is after all a collection of sovereign member states and it has only limited competencies to act internally in research policy and, and even less so in education. Externally, it may be a strong regulator for trade, but it lacks a consolidated uh, foreign policy. Even though the new EU president, um, Angela von der Leyen, presented the new commission as a geopolitical commission, Europe now has to deal first and foremost with the internal tensions created by Corona and the challenges to avoid further fragmentation, north, south and west, east, over the consequent economic recovery. And as Anthony said, nationalist trends from within China are meeting those within Europe, especially in the southern, southern and eastern parts of it, which is further challenging the cohesion at the EU as a political union. And let's not forget that China applies with its New Silk Road or BRI a bilateral foreign policy approach to, to Europe, dealing not with the EU as a whole, but with individual member states especially in these parts of, of Europe. In that respect, Dominic's com comment on, on Eurocentrism was not, that Eurocentrism was never completely away in, in social sciences and humanities is relevant. And even more so that renationalization or relocalization of social science and humanities is indeed a threat in Europe as well. So we are in these difficult times together and need to play our role and, and fulfill our missions. And I think we all agreed in these uh, panels that we um, need for this to maintain collaboration as a global academic community with shared academic values. And, and no matter in which, situ with, in which system uh, you're based as a university, I think, I think Nian's taught about leadership that being a world-class university implies that you do more than just following what your government tells you to do is, is there's a very important one. And with this, um, I would like to thank all panelists for sharing uh, their views and their thoughts so openly. Um, we will certainly continue this, this conversation in the months to come. And I would like to say to all our colleagues around the world, thank you for watching this video and please stay in touch. And keep an eye on, on our website for announcements on our dissemination conference and the launch of our book, which will have the title China and Europe on a New Silk Road, Connecting Universities Across Eurasia. Thank you so much. <laughs>